As Jesus was walking along, he saw a man who had been born blind. Teacher, whose sin caused him to be born blind? Was it his own or his parents' sin? His blindness has nothing to do with his sins or his parents' sins. He is blind so that God's power might be seen at work in him. As long as it is they, you must keep on doing the work of him who sent me. Night is coming. But no one can work. <laughs> While I am in the world, I am the light for the world. After he said this, Jesus spat on the ground and made some mud with the spittle. He rubbed the mud on the man's eyes. Go and wash your face in the pool of Siloam. This name means scent. So the man went, washed his face, and came back, seeing. His neighbors then, and the people who had seen him begging before this, asked, isn't this the man who used to sit and beg? He's the one. No, he isn't. He just looks like him. I am the man. How is it that you can now see? The man called Jesus made some mud, rubbed it on my eyes, and told me to go to Siloam and wash my face. So I went, and as soon as I washed, I could see. Where is he? I don't know. Yeah. Praise God. Let's stand to pray and receive the word this morning. Father, I just thank you this morning for your blessing and lifting up our spirit through your word. I thank you for the application of this word to our lives. And I thank you, Lord, for um, your church who is opening the eyes and preparing to see you and to see your will be done on this earth as it is in heaven. We thank you in Jesus' name. Amen. So I want to start with just thinking about the title for today is simply, Thanks to Jesus, I was blind, but now I see. What a difference it is when we come to Christ. And when we engage in living according to Christ, the difference between us and those that are still blind. Life without natural vision must be extremely painful and difficult. Not being able to see the beauty of nature and the wonder of life in key moments must be devastating. 21 who is vision impaired. We do appreciate people who have overcome their demise with blindness by becoming outstanding persons. Some special singers like Ray Charles, I remember Ray Charles, Stevie Wonder, 
and recently Andrea Buscelli, they're all blind. Um, apparently, Stevie Wonder uh, was born and placed on an incubator and his retina fell off and he became blind. Um, same thing with child, Ray Charles, he also was blind and early on in his life and um, had some other issues besides that. Um, but it was an outstanding singer. And then Andrea Buscelli, for example, when he was 12 years old, he um, suffered an injury while playing soccer and had a brain injury that caused a hemorrhoid and that hemorrhoid caused him to lose vision at 12. Um, but they did the best they could with what they had and of course their talent was music. Um, the first two became blind at birth, like Charles and Stevie, and the last one was an accident later on. Um, certainly, no one in their right mind will trade pain for blindness. If I were to tell you, would you like to be blind and be become instead famous, would you accept that? No. If I were to tell you, would you give an eye for an exchange of a million dollars, will you do that? Yes or no? Are you here this morning? How about two million? Three million? No. Our eyes are precious. I was living to El Salvador um, Saturday morning and then that Thursday before Saturday morning, I woke up with my left eye, the vessels, blood vessels in my left eye burst and it was all covered with blood. And I thought, oh no, now what? I've been through surgery, uh, I've been through all this and now am I gonna be able to go? But I gave my word to the pastor and we had a bunch of pastors coming and I felt like I must be there and by God's grace I went my, my eye is doing well right now, praise God. I never had pain or had problems with vision. It was just something that happened. They said, May, sometimes when you sneeze hard, that could happen. Uh, it could be also uh, a virus. Um, it could be also allergies. But nevertheless, I was able to go. And again, uh, I value, I'm sure you value your eyes. I value my eyes. And, it's so wonderful to have vision. So Jesus encountered this blind man. And as he's walking, this was after the, um, uh, the Feast of Tents. Uh, as he's walking, he finds him. And then the discussion comes as to how this happened. But chapter 9 of, of John is divided in two parts. It's very easy to go through it. It's all about a narrative of this miracle. The first 12 verses are about the miracle, and then 13 until the end, it's about the opposition of the miracle, of the opposition of how this man got healed on a Sabbath day, the opposition of who healed him, um, the opposition of even bringing witnesses to verify if he was actually blind or not, bringing even the parents of this young man, uh, or uh, older person, but basically you saw in the video, it was already an adult, and the parents said, hey, listen, he's big enough to tell you how this happened. So it's interesting that this miracle caused such a big overwhelm uh, notice of the Pharisees because it was the Sabbath. They were more interested in following tradition and following uh, religious uh, uh, aspects than actually giving God the glory for a miracle that someone was not able to see and now this person is able to see. Isn't that sad? So let's go to chapter 9 again and, um, and let's go through this. Uh, now as Jesus passed by, he saw a man who was blind from birth. And his disciples asked him, saying, Rabbi, who sinned, this man or his parents? that he was born blind. Here's a question, my friend. This is what we always encounter uh, in our faith, and you need to be careful, because I've been there. I'm sure you've been there also. You probably did not notice. 
but something goes wrong with you in your life. When something goes wrong, the first thing that you ask yourself, have I done something to deserve what is happening to me? Have you been there before? Have you been there before? Okay. It's most of us. Here's another way. When you see someone that's going through a struggle in their lives, and you see this someone, and um, this person has, is going through a crisis, and this person is falling apart and broken, and this person, let's say, is, a, is, a, is not a, a Christian, the first thing that you do with this person as you talk, you want to hear, why are you going through this and stuff? You start investigating and why this and why that. And, and you try to always to come up with answers as to why their crisis is happening to them. Yes or no? And so we have that tendency now for Hispanics and their culture, the Hispanic culture, uh, which has our tradition of being a little bit um, superstitious, they may think you, someone doesn't like you because you're going through this. Someone is wishing you wrong because you went through this. And uh, some of the people uh, in the Hispanic world, they go to the bruja, the witch, to get a cleansing uh, because someone is doing the eye on you and is wishing you bad luck and whatever. I mean, it may be some, to some extent true in some cases, but not in every case. Sometimes we go through crisis in our lives so Jesus will glorify himself in us. Even when you're not able to pinpoint why you're dealing with this, why you're suffering through this, why this happening to you, why good, bad things happen to good people, and it's because God is also using things that may be wrong with you in order to show you the way and get you out of the pit and tell you how much he loves you. This was the case. The question was, who sinned for you to be blind, for this person to be blind? Who sinned? Now, the Bible is very clear and tells us in Romans that we all sin. Except for Jesus, the rest of us, all of us sin. Yes or no? So Jesus is saying, it's not their sin that caused this. Because when I was looking for the root, where this happened for this person to deserve that. Now, in the Hebrew culture, if you were blind, if you were handicapped in another way, or very poor, they felt that you were cursed. There was a curse in your life. There was a curse in your family. And um, we've done something called inner healing here in our church. We do it every now and then on Saturdays during fasting. And we pray against things that come from families. Because some families, yes, they do have things that happen again and again and again. The single mother, I met a, uh, there was a family here um, a Colombian family, I'll never forget them when we started out in the hotel, remember Olivia? Uh, this, this family had a very beautiful mom and a grandmother and then five girls. And they were the prettiest girls you would see. Very pretty. And it was interesting. Grandma was left abandoned by the husband. Mom was abandoned by her husband. And then the little girls started getting married and leaving church, and then they started being by themselves with more little girls. Now, that is a curse. But in this case of the blind man, it was not a curse. God let it be for a special moment and a special season for him to see. You got that? So we're going to make that clear. Another thing that's very important is how Jesus made miracles. This is the sixth miracle Jesus does in the book of John. And it's interesting that he called miracles uh, like when he changed the water into wine, when he told the 
the man that could not get into the pool. He just touched him, prayed for him, and he was healed. Uh, and he told him, go, go and see the priest of the temple. Present yourself to the temple. Um, Jesus uses many ways, and this one was very different. Uh, he decided to spit at the clay at the ground uh, where man was formed, actually. That's where we come from. And then place that clay over his eyes. And heal him that way. But here's one principle. You ready for the next principle? Again, not every curse comes because we've done something wrong. Or our parents. Sometimes we wonder, uh, for example, the Kennedy family. How many of you remember the Kennedy family? It's interesting. Uh, they were bootleggers, actually. That's how they became rich. They, they would come, they would go to Canada. Um, and um, they would cross with liquor from there in the time when it was prohibited. And that's how they made their money. But then you look at the Kennedys and you see tragedy, 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 tragedy. Um, and it's sad. Uh, even though they were famous and rich, they had a lot of tragedy. A lot of people say, well, that's because they were involved in selling alcohol when it was prohibited. Um, and so people always think, why this happened? Now, Jesus does this miracle his own way. He could have said, open your eyes. That would be enough. But he says, now go wash at the fountain called scent. So here's the principle. Very important principle for you and for me in our lives. Faith happens when we respond to faith are you with me? Faith obeys. If God tells you something to do, like he told you this morning, get up and go to a church on the rock and you're here. You obey. That's why you're here. Faith demands obedience. Because the just walk by faith, not by sight. And so it's a godly principle to understand that when we walk by faith and not by sight, we're walking in faith. Sometimes you don't see the things. Sometimes you see things that are contrary to your life, to your faith, and you think, when is this going to end? When am I going to have a breakthrough? When can things change? And you there asking God and asking and begging God and nothing is happening. And you may think, God is not listening to me. I must have done something wrong. The answer is, God is about to do something. Just keep believing. Keep trusting God. Faith over fear was one of the songs today. Have faith over fear. Because Jesus uses people who are weak, who are ordinary, and he makes them into extraordinary people. You and I have become extraordinary because we answer the call to walk with Jesus. You and I, before that, we're just ordinary people, but now we can say we are extraordinary, very special people. You're VIP for God because you are his child, his daughter, his son. God doesn't have nephews or grandkids. We're all God's children. Aren't you glad about that? Now, verses 4 and 5, Jesus talks about his work. He says, I must work the works of him who sent me. Him we capitalize. That is our father. What it is day. The night is coming when no one can work. As long as I am in the world, I am the light for the world. My friends, it's getting darker. It's getting darker. Unless you are not listening, unless you can't see the news, you will not know what is happening. But most of you know what is happening. The horrible 
attack against morality, against the family, against children. When a store, which I'm not going to mention, decided to place all kinds of things to sexualize children, and a lot of Christians responded by sending letters and notifications to that store. And the store started plummeting like it happened to Bud Light. I'm sure you don't drink beer, but if you end up being drinking, don't drink Bud Light. Just kidding, just kidding. But what happened now? When they started losing $9 billion and being hurt at the pocket, they withdrew their plan. See, we have a voice. Because we're not blind. For them, they're blind. They cannot see. You and I have natural eyes and we're spiritual eyes that we see beyond what they can see because we've got the eyes of Jesus. June 16. In Los Angeles, California, the stadium, they invited the people the mafia or the alphabet. And especially a group that dress like nuns, but they're not even dressed like nuns. They do more stuff. And they do all kinds of obscene plays outside in public with the men at a cross and then other men dressed really awkwardly, begins to do all kinds of moves over the cross and making fun of Jesus. That's what we live today. And God is saying, church, wake up. Some people live Christianity Pretending they don't see. Looking like the saying says, the blind eye, looking the other way. We're the least active group now. Everyone is out in a forceful way coming against our children to the nearest neighborhood, libraries, schools, public places, stores. And the Apostle Paul said in Ephesians chapter 5, he says, wake up you who slumber. Wake up church. Because we're no longer blind and don't pretend to be blind. You have Jesus in you. I was blind, but now I see. Jesus is working through his church now. This is what he says. Verse 4 and 5 says, I must work the works of him who sent me. Well, this day, what is day? Because, you know, it's the night's coming, and it's getting darker. It is getting darker. As long as I am in the world, I am the light of the world. When he said this thing, he has passed. He spot on the ground and made clay with saliva and anointed the eyes of the blind man with the clay. And he said to him, go wash in the pool of Siloam, which is translated as sent. So faith comes, faith obeys. Amen? When faith comes, faith responds. Then the Opposition became, okay, how this man? So they went and got, it was like a court uh, case. They got witnesses. Okay, who saw this man? Who knew this man? And they brought people from the streets. Hey, have you seen this guy? Was he blind before? And they go, yeah, yeah, we know. He was blind. He was blind. And the Pharisees began to question this man. So hard and so tough that 
for some reason, he didn't care what they say. All he felt was the happiness of being able to see for the first time. And he started talking to the Pharisees as he was a authority with the word. <laughs> it was so interesting. Uh, if, you, if, if, if you see there how he answered to them from verse 13 through 24, he begins to talk to them, have a conversation with them. Um, so they again, verse 24, um, so they again call, and they call their parents too. And the parents, hey, he's big enough to tell you. Ask him. So again, they called the man who was blind and said to him, give God the glory. We know that this man is a sinner. Talking about Jesus. That's how horrific this Pharisees were. He answered and said, whether he's a sinner or not, I do not know. One thing I know, that though I was blind, now I see. Many of us were blind before and now we see. I used to be, a long time ago, thank God for that, a narcissist. I love myself too much. I used to love myself too much. Uh, it was me first, me second, and me third. My family would, would come up on number four. Because I was blind. I used to come to church when I started going to church. And I would pull out a Lincoln, a $5 bill. And I was making good money at the bank. I was working at the bank. But I wanted to show everybody that was a giver in church, and I would pull out a $5 bill to put in the pocket. You know why? Because I was blind. I was thinking, if I could travel by myself through the bank, I was in the credit department, international department, I wanted to travel, and it didn't happen. You know why? God was protecting me, because I was Blind. Some people that are blind, they say, well, a little bit of fornication is not going to do bad for me. Oh, yeah. It will. Because they're blind. A little bit of lies is not, not going to do me any harm. I can control that. It's a lie. A little bit of alcohol is not going to do harm to me because I can control it. Happy hour. After three margaritas, I'm going to be okay. No, you're not. You pass the alcohol limit. If you drive and you have an accident, you're going to be in jail for a while, if not forever, depending on how the accident, what happens in the accident. Before, we had an excuse to do bad things because we were blind. But ever since we received Jesus as our Lord and Savior, we were able to see. And because now we're able to see, now we're able to do his will. We no longer have the excuse that we're blind. Amen? Simple but powerful answer from this young man. We know the miracle caused the vision. And then as we wind out, as we summarize this chapter, um, in verse 31 on the narrative continues about this man. Now we know that God does not hear sinners, but if anyone is a worshiper of God and does he will, he hears him. He was talking about Jesus. Since the world began, it has been unheard of anyone open the eyes of one who was born blind. This is the blind man talking. <laughs> if this man were not from God, he could do nothing. They answered and said to him, You were completely born in sin, and are you teaching us? And they cast him out. <laughs> so I'm going to finish with this. There is true vision and true blindness. It's your choice. Are you ready? 
Go with me to verses 35 to 41 to finish up. Jesus heard that they had cast him out, and when he found him, he said to him, Do you believe in the Son of God? And he answered and said, Who is he, Lord, that I may believe in him? And Jesus said to him, You have both seen him, and it is he who is talking with you. Imagine, you were, you were blind all your life, and then you get to see Jesus personally. It doesn't get any better. Then he said, Lord, I believe, and he worshiped him. And Jesus said, for judgment I have come into this world, that those who do not see may see, and those who see may be made blind. He's talking about natural vision versus spiritual vision. Then some of the Pharisees who were with him heard his words and said to him, are we blind also? They were upset, and they were sarcastic. Are we blind also? Jesus Jesus said to them, if you were blind, you have no sin. But now you say we see. Therefore, your sin remains. Sin makes people blind. Coming to Jesus makes people whole. We are broken vessels. Sometimes we don't see with the right eyes. Be careful. Be careful how you see things. Always ask God how you see others. Sometimes I see people that it's funny and very interesting. I see people that plays all kinds of scriptures in their media outlet. And then they live a, a life according to sin, not according to Jesus. They're just blind. They think they know the faith. They think they have faith. They think they're in faith. But no, they're not. You may put all the verses you want in your, in your wall. You may know even the Bible. But if your attitude, I, I, I'm going to tell you something real quick. Very important. Very important. It's not what you know the Bible. That's important. But it's not what you know or the Bible makes you who you are. It's what you practice or what you know that makes you who you are. I know lots of people that can even memorize Psalms 119. But their behavior is totally different. Because they may see the scripture, but they don't apply. They're still blind. Got it? Let's be careful, all of us. Let's not point the finger. Like when you judge people, and Jesus said, what, what are you judging your brother when he's got a spit? And you have a whole log in your eye. Let's ask Jesus to remove any blindness in us.